This is at Space Launch Complex 2 on North Vandenberg Air Force Base. Mobile Surface Tower completely encloses the Delta II for launch preparations. Provides weather protection and has uh, all of the access to the vehicle that the launch engineers and technicians need. The launch vehicle is 128 feet tall as we see it there. It's 8 feet in diameter with a 10 foot fairing. And with this configuration there are three solid rocket boosters attached. This is the time lapse of the mobile service tower being pulled away from the rocket. The launch team has been preparing for the loading of cryogenic propellants, which will begin in about a half an hour. At this time, there are no technical issues being worked. NSC. Button clerk, Al OTC. Uh, SMD. Loud and clear. NASA CE. Loud and clear. NLM. Loud and clear. LCM. Dot USO report go for cryogenic tanking. Go. LD report go for cryogenic tanking. LC, this is LD. You are go for cryogenic tanking. Project. ATC 1, begin preparations for first stage locks loading. Roger. FAC, initiate booster engine section high speed fan and report when heat is on Alpha to Golf. Roger. Prop 2, verify vehicle actuation pre press press open. Sixteen seconds and counting. We're joined here now in the launch control room with our NASA administrator, Charlie Bolden, who is here for the uh, SMAP launch, and uh, we're we're very glad that uh, he continues to 
come to Vandenberg for our launches out here because they're very important in the uh, role of the agency as far as Earth science. The, uh, the SMAP mission is NASA's fifth Earth science launch in the last 11 months. So, Charlie, can you tell us why it's important to NASA to study Earth and the global climate change? Well, I appreciate your allowing me to be here with you, George, first of all. And uh, you've kind of summarized it, to be quite honest. It, we're very proud of the fact that in, uh, in a year that we sort of coined the year of Earth, uh, this will be the fifth uh, of, of our launches in this, this year of 12 months, uh, which I think is phenomenal to have that many launches. And why is it important? We're trying to understand this planet on which we live. Uh, we're trying to understand the changing processes here. Everybody talks about climate change and other kinds of uh, the con sometimes controversial issues. What's most important, though, is for us to be able to get as much data to scientists and decision makers as possible. Uh, SMAP, or the Soil Moisture Active Pathogen Mission this morning, uh, is going to be incredibly important because it will be the first space-borne asset that allows us to look at freeze-thaw cycles uh, to determine the difference between uh, Earth, areas of Earth that are frozen and those that are normal, uh, with normal moisture, and it helps in understanding uh, the, the carbon dioxide cycle also, which we believe contributes to, to the climate change. So really important for us to be able to get the data that this mission is going to bring down. Well, for you personally, and, yeah. and being here, what's the most exciting part about SMAP for you? Oh, what's the most exciting You know, I think um, the most important, the exciting part about any launch is, is finally see out here at Vandenberg, it's a little different than being back at the Cape because we're sort of in a bowl, I think, and even when you're at, where I usually go at the Launch Control Center, when you go outside, you don't see anything. You know, you, you can't look across at the launch pad and you hear this rumble and then all of a sudden this beauty, it's, it's just incredible, it's hard to describe, but you see this beautiful uh, rocket rise from behind the mountains. Uh, so uh, that's the most exciting part for me is to actually be here to experience it with the, I think a couple of thousand people that are here this morning, which is really, really, really important. But it's also exciting to see a mission get off to a good start um, and hopefully, you know, we'll be on orbit, solar panels out and operating as soon as possible. Well, Charlie, thank you very much. And uh, we're glad you were able to uh, stop by and uh, hopefully we will see you uh, after launch with a big, big smile. I, I look at, I'm looking forward to it and uh, just want to thank you very much for allowing me to come in again. Thanks so much. And we're at uh, T-minus one hour, eight minutes, 12 seconds, and counting. This is Delta Launch Control. For uh, allowing me the opportunity to come and talk to you this morning. So if we could uh, go ahead and roll the video, uh, Chung will tell us uh, what's been happening to get the uh, Delta II ready. Well, George, what we see here is the uh, first stage uh, being transported out of uh, is a uh, transportation canister. Uh, as you know, the um, uh, Delta II rocket, this first stage is built by uh, United Launch Alliance in their facility in Decatur, Alabama, and it uh, was transported by road here to Vandenberg Air Force Base. What we see here is the first stage being uh, moved out to its uh, facility processing facility at Slick 2 on its uh, lift uh, fixture there. Uh, it is being uh, backed into the horizontal processing facility where it will undergo electrical checkout and some receiving and inspections of the vehicle uh, itself. Uh, next we see it being lifted out uh, and transported to the Slick 2 uh, pad itself. Uh, this is the, uh, we see the shot of the mobile service tower uh, in the background there. As we get, uh, next, we'll see the, uh, the, uh, the first date there being prepared to be uh, erected uh, into the vertical position off of its uh, transportation dolly there. this shot you can see the uh, first stage engine uh, designated as an RS-27 that was built by uh, Aerojet Rocketdyne. Uh, in this shot we can see the uh, first stage being lifted into the mobile service tower in preparation for being in place on the uh, launch mount. 
and now the mobile service tower is moving forward to line uh, the uh, first stage uh, on top of the launch mount. Next, uh, another important element of the uh, launch vehicle are the three solid rocket motors. Uh, these are built by uh, uh, Aerojet Rocketdyne. Uh, I'm sorry, uh, ATK in Utah. They are brought here to the uh, Stick 2 facility and they are placed upon their um, lifting fixtures. In this shot, we see they're being lifted and to be ready to uh, be uh, lined up with the uh, uh, first stage in the two is a proper position aligned at 120 degrees apart. Uh, there will be three solid rocket motors, each providing 100,000 pounds of thrust uh, uh, for liftoff. Next, we'll see the uh, what's called payload fairing. It's basically a uh, protective clamshell around the SMAP observatory. It's uh, protected during the early portion of the flight from aerodynamic heating. Here is the uh, uh, Delta II second stage being uh, rolled out to the uh, Slick 2 complex itself and it is being lifted in place within the MST uh, as a part of the uh, preparation for mating with the uh, first stage which is, has already been mounted onto uh, the launch mount there. These are the uh, doors in the mobile service tower to maintain a clean atmosphere. Here we're seeing the technicians lowering uh, the second stage onto the launch vehicle. This is a shot of the uh, SMAP observatory within its uh, transportation canister being placed inside the mobile service tower. And finally, the payload fairing are being aligned to uh, close out the vehicle in part of the final preparations for flight. The, uh, again, the payload fairing protects the uh, SMAP observatory through the early stages of flight. Well, thank you, Chung, and uh, I guess this means for the Delta II, rather than uh, loading the liquid oxygen aboard, it's, it's ready to fly at this point, isn't yes, it? Yes, we're almost there. Well, at this point, we will uh, go back and uh, monitor some of our launch countdown uh, activities that are going on. And uh, at this point, there are no issues or concerns uh, going on in the count. So we're at T-minus 56 minutes, 30 seconds and counting. This is Delta Launch Control. 21 minutes. Copy. Prop 2, report 99% locks, float switch, pick up. Roger. 25 minutes, locks. That's complete. Prop 2, cycle locks, fill and drain, and valve closed to open two times. Verify talkbacks. Roger. And while that's in work, LC position, easy camera to monitor the Vernier engine bleeds at the vehicle launch mount during bleed check at release. That's complete. And report clear to pressurize vehicle lock tank to check relief and establish PE lock bleeds. Clear. Fill and drain cycles complete. Who is, uh, Kent Kellogg is our SMAP project manager with the Jet Propulsion Laboratory in Pasadena. And uh, Kent has been uh, working this program for about how long now, Kent? Six and a half years. Six and a half. So uh, this is this is the uh, pinnacle of six and a half years of work, probably for you and, and several members of your team. I would expect uh, a bunch of us. A lot of us have been on it since uh, early formulation, and then we have uh, a number of scientists who've actually been working on this concept for uh, fifteen to twenty years. So really? it's a real treat for them. Well, we're going to look now at a, a, uh, some video of what uh, went on both at Jet Propulsion Laboratory and then here at Vandenberg to get SMAP ready to fly. So, Ken, if you could tell us what we're seeing as we roll the video uh, and go through the uh, whole uh, processing flow here, Ken. Be happy to. So this is a test of our solar array. Uh, this was taken about uh, a little over a year ago 
in uh, the Jet Propulsion Laboratory clean room. Now we're looking at the radar assembly. This is part of the instrument uh, that's on the non-spinning side of the spacecraft being integrated to the bus. This is the first spin test we did of the Goddard provided radiometer um, and, uh, and spin assembly uh, being tested in the anechoic chamber. Now it's being lifted and installed on top of the spacecraft. Uh, this is our large deployable reflector boom antenna being tested. We've done a number of deployments, a total of 18. So this is a very well tested system. Uh, now we're looking at the big uh, reflector boom antenna being installed on the uh, spacecraft. We put the spacecraft in an anechoic chamber uh, to test it to make sure that the electrical systems don't generate noise that could interfere uh, with the science measurement. And then we test the spacecraft environmentally uh, to make sure that it's compatible with the uh, uh, loading and vibration that we see on the uh, spacecraft and or on the rocket and then uh, the thermal environment and vacuum environment of space. And then finally last July uh, we do an integrated spin test where we have the whole observatory together uh, and then in October, uh, October 15, uh, we uh, ship the uh, spacecraft to uh, Vandenberg uh, for uh, payload processing. Uh, you see it now being uh, uh, loaded into the Astrotech payload processing facility. Uh, we ship the spacecraft uh, on an air ride van, so we've got a nice smooth rise to Vandenberg. First thing we do when it arrives at uh, Astrotech is uh, to check out the systems and make sure that it's healthy after shipment. Uh, that all went very well. We had no issues uh, uh, following, uh, uh, following shipment. Uh, spacecraft checked out perfectly. Uh, you can see it here being raised on its uh, transportation fixture, kind of a great view of the, the uh, whole observatory being raised from a uh, horizontal to a, uh, a vertical position prior to all the functional checkouts that we do. Uh, we load propellant onto the, uh, onto the observatory. We have a little over 81 kilograms of, uh, of uh, propellant. And then we uh, transfer the observatory uh, from its uh, uh, fixture. Uh, now, now you see the spacecraft. This is a really dramatic view that I like of the observatory uh, being lifted and moved into the main clean room at uh, Astrotech. So this is kind of a nice slow reveal uh, showing uh, the spacecraft in all its uh, uh, fully thermal blanketed uh, uh, glory uh, being brought in. Uh, you can see they uh, move the spacecraft very, uh, very carefully, uh, take a lot of care at this point. Uh, we've got uh, uh, a complex system that's been very well tested. You can see the uh, propellant tank kind of sticking out a little bit uh, uh, below the bottom of the spacecraft and it's being put onto its uh, uh, test stand uh, following, uh, uh, following delivery. So uh, once we get it in place, as I mentioned, we do the uh, functional checkouts. Uh, everything checked out good. We load propellant. Now we're moving the uh, uh, observatory to install onto the launch vehicle adapter. This is the, uh, the piece of equipment uh, that attaches our observatory to the top of the Delta II uh, rocket. So uh, this is one of the last steps that we uh, take uh, before we install onto the, uh, the Delta II. Uh, this was done in uh, early January, around January 8th. Uh, now we're ready to move the observatory out to uh, Space Launch Complex 2, where the Delta II is located. Uh, we first uh, put a bag, a protective bag, around the observatory. You see them uh, doing those operations now. Uh, the next step is to install the observatory in a special uh, can. Uh, so here you see them uh, canning the observatory. Again, this provides an additional uh, protection for the observatory as we transport it uh, outside the uh, payload processing facility uh, out to uh, Space Launch Complex 2, or SLIC 2, as we, uh, uh, as we call it. So we put another bag around the can. So again, the, the spacecraft is uh, triply uh, protected here. You see them lift that uh, assembly in preparation uh, to uh, make the uh, one mile or one and a half mile drive from the payload processing facility uh, to uh, SLIC 2. Uh, that was done on, uh, on uh, January 13th. It went very well. 
Uh, we got installed on the uh, Delta II rocket. Uh, we had no, no issues whatsoever. We had a very, very smooth uh, payload processing flow here. Can you tell us briefly what's going to happen later tonight after it comes off the rocket? When does the solar array start to deploy and, and how does that solar array sequence work? We, we have some animation too. Oh, we have we animation. Yeah. That's fantastic. Yeah, right. uh, let's go ahead and roll the animation, please. So here you see the uh, uh, fairing payload, uh, the payload fairing separate. That happens about four minutes uh, after liftoff. Uh, we separate from the upper stage 57 minutes after liftoff, not, uh, not quite an hour. Uh, onboard sequences on the spacecraft uh, uh, immediately begin to establish communication uh, with the ground via the uh, TDRS uh, tracking uh, relay network. Uh, we expect to uh, have the spacecraft immediately begin to deploy the uh, solar arrays, and uh, once the arrays are deployed, uh, the uh, spacecraft attitude control system will uh, start looking for the sun. Uh, at that point, we're pointed on the sun, we've established communication. That process could be done as early as eight minutes after we separate, but it could take as long as 50 minutes, uh, depending on our orientation after separation. Now we're looking at the big uh, reflector being deployed. That happens, that starts about two weeks after launch, takes about two weeks to get through that. And then 50 days after, uh, after launch, we'll actually spin that big antenna up. And here you see that uh, dramatically shown in the animation. You see the spacecraft actually counter rotating. It rotates in the reverse direction uh, until we get spun up to full speed. And uh, at that point, we're ready to turn on both our instruments, the uh, uh, Goddard uh, radiometer and the JPL radar and we can actually begin sending the uh, valuable science data back to Earth uh, for the scientists to begin the, uh, uh, the calibration and validation process. Well, Kent, thanks so much. I know you're looking forward to the launch, but I know you're also looking forward almost as much to seeing the solar rays start to come out Very after much. we're off the rocket. So. We, we look forward to each step. You know, we take it one step at a time. It's, uh, it's fantastic to uh, get to launch night here. Uh, we're hoping that we'll have clear skies uh, for all the folks uh, that are going to be watching uh, uh, here at Vandenberg. And uh, the spacecraft, uh, the rocket, will uh, f uh, do a flyby at JPL. We hope that uh, JPL, uh, the skies are uh, clear enough uh, so the folks there uh, will be able to uh, uh, give it a wave off uh, uh, quickly as it flies by. Thank you very much, George. Thank you, Kent. And we're now at T-minus 36 minutes, 20 seconds and counting. This is Delta Launch Control. Report ready to continue with countdown on channel one, ATC three. Ready. Team one. Ready. Team two. Ready. DST. Ready. FSC. Ready. GE. FMA. Go. SCM. Ready. SSC. Ready. QAM three. Ready. Inspector six. Ready. RC. Ready. SYS. Ready. GE. GE's on six feet. You'll cover. Roger. GE's on six. Roger. LC, remove red tag from ORD bus enable. Remove. ORD enable, red tag off. Off. TC, ORD enable on. On. SSC, report second stage destruct SNA number one and number two safe. Safe. MISCO, turn command carrier on with pilot tone on the standby transmitter and report complete. MISCO proceeding. By CRD self test received and removed. Received and removed. SSC report CRD battery voltages for alpha 32 decimal one volts. 32 decimal one. Bravo 32 decimal one volt. One. TM2 report CRD AGC voltages. That's here for CRD one. Record four decimal six. Four decimal six. NTM2 report CRD EED ohms. CRD1 27.6. CRD2 27.8. TM2 obtain CRD external data trend. Roger. FAC report guidance section temp. 72 degrees F. TM2 report CRD number one battery temp. Nine nine decimal three. Nine decimal three. Report CRD number two battery temp. Nine seven decimal five. Five. Let's go. Report.
Report range ready for CID checks. Range ready. TM2, verify CRD 1 and 2, pilot tone received. Received. LC, ORC bus enable on. On. SSC, CRD 1 and 2 internal. On internal. MISCO, send one second CRD self test on the standby transmitter. Roger, on my mark. Three. Two, one, mark, plus one, test removed. TM2, report self-test complete. Complete. MISCO, switch to master transmitter and report complete. MISCO proceeding. A lot of 10, mission manager from the Law Services Program at Kennedy Space Center. And uh, we've, we have uh, three missions flying that uh, our CubeSats on this flight. And, and Scott, first of all, uh, tell us briefly what they are. All right, well, we have, again, three missions uh, consisting of four CubeSats flying on this mission. The first is Firebird 2, and these are two small CubeSats that will be studying electron microbursts from the Van Allen radiation belts. These two spacecraft are from the University of Montana. Each of the satellites are about 15 centimeters by 10 by 10 centimeters, and they fly together in one peapod dispenser. Then we have ExoCube, which is a 30 centimeter by 10 centimeter by 10 centimeter CubeSat from the California Polytechnic State University in San Luis Obispo. And ExoCube is carrying a NASA instrument from Goddard, and we'll be looking at the density of certain uh, atomic uh, particles in the upper atmosphere. And then lastly, we have another 30 by 10 by 10 CubeSat coming from the uh, University of Michigan and JPL called Griffix. And Griffix is a technology demonstration of a new camera that JPL is interested in ultimately flying on a much larger satellite in geostationary orbit. Well, for these three uh, missions, the, the uh, deployment from the Delta II is, is a little bit unique. Uh, it occurs sometime after SMAP separates from the Delta II, so I, I wonder if you can tell us a little bit how that deployment sure. works when and when it'll happen. Okay. Well, uh, all of these CubeSats are being launched into space into, in uh, P-Pod deployers, which are uh, basically metal jack-in-the-boxes, <laughs> to describe them uh, in a simple way, that contain the spacecraft until it's time for them to come out. There's a large spring inside that uh, when the command is sent from the rocket to open the, the door that covers that container, the satellites are ejected out by that spring at over a meter per second. So what's going to happen is the uh, the mission is going to uh, to launch, and the SMAP will be ultimately separated about 50 some minutes into the mission, and then the upper stage will do an additional burn to provide some separation from that primary spacecraft. At one hour 45 minutes and seven seconds into the mission, the first peapod dispenser will be commanded to open, ejecting Firebird to uh, the two satellites that are there inside it. A hundred second, seconds later, uh, ExoCube will be uh, told to, to leave, and then a hundred seconds after that, Griffix will depart. So uh, it's about uh, how long before they phone home? <laughs> All right, well, in, in order to protect the primary spacecraft in the second stage, we don't allow the CubeSats to radiate until 45 minutes after they've left their dispensers. There's timers on board. That, are, uh, that start once they leave the Peapod. And uh, in this case, on this mission, uh, they're all gonna start about an hour after they separate. So uh, then they have to fly over a ground station that can hear from them. Um, the, uh, each university that's operating these, these CubeSats, they have their own ground stations. And so it'll be later on this afternoon before those CubeSats make their first uh, pass over those ground stations. Now, they are operated on amateur frequencies, and the ham community out there helps these universities out. And there's a very, very distinct possibility that a ham operator in Europe may be the first to hear from these spacecraft after they've ejected. But the first... Center. Be one and two pitch up. Second motion to the stop. Return in the center. Center. You wanted to pitch down. Second motion 
with the stop. Returning to the center. Center. You want it to yawn, right? Second motion to the stop. Returning to null. Null. Do you want to yawn left? Return in the center. Enter. First stage loose complete. 82 off. FSC, the limits off. Off. Timer, report second stage hydraulic pump turn off time. One three colon two seven colon five four. So, while we are in this hold, we're going to talk to Vern Thorpe, joining us here in the mission control room. Vern is the United Launch Alliance Program Manager for NASA Missions. And uh, so we want to talk to Vern some about uh, what the Delta II will be doing after it lifts off today about the flight events. But uh, first of all, Vern, tell us, how are we doing? Are we working anything of significance? Are we watching anything? Uh, so far, so good. We've got a, a good, healthy vehicle. All the parameters coming off the launch vehicle uh, look very good right now. Uh, there is one thing we're watching. That's weather-related. Uh, we're watching upper-level winds. We've got a very strong wind shear right now, about th 34,000 feet in altitude. And uh, you know that we periodically send up weather balloons to, to monitor the speed and direction of the upper level winds. So we're going to have to keep a close eye on that. Uh, right now, uh, that's the, the primary concern that we have. Well, Vern, tell us uh, some. We've got some animation to show us what's going to be happening with the Delta II as it lifts off. So if we could roll the animation and Vernus tell us about the flight of the Delta II. Sure. Well, here uh, is what the vehicle looks like right now on the pad. And uh, we're using the uh, what we call the 7320 configuration of the Delta II for this. It has three SRBs that will help with liftoff. And between the main engine and those three SRBs, we'll lift off with about 600,000 pounds of thrust. And for this mission, the first major event that we'll see after liftoff will be the jettison of the three SRBs. Now, those solid rocket boosters uh, burn for about one minute we will actually hold on to them and not jettison them until about 99 seconds into flight. And that's to make sure that the uh, splashdown, the predicted splashdown uh, areas are well clear of uh, some of the local things offshore here like the oil platforms. Uh, once we jettison those SRBs, that first stage will continue to burn for about 4 minutes and 20 seconds. Once we've used up the fuel, we'll shut down the engine. Uh, 6 seconds later, we'll separate the upper stage. And eight seconds after that, we'll start the engine on the upper stage for the first of several burns for this mission. Uh, right after we, or a few seconds after we begin that uh, first burn, we'll be jettisoning the payload fairing uh, once we're up out of the atmosphere. And that first burn will last uh, about six minutes. Uh, at that point, we'll be in a parking orbit coast for about 41 minutes, then we'll do a second uh, short burn, about 12 seconds, and then we'll separate the spacecraft, as you see uh, right here. That entire sequence will take about 57 minutes, so just a little bit less than an hour. And then once we separate the primary, we're going to do a couple of other things. We're going to do a third engine burn to adjust the orbit slightly. And uh, following that third burn, we'll actually be separating four CubeSats. These are very small uh, secondary payloads. They're uh, so small you can hold them in your hand. We have three dispensers on board, and from those three dispensers, we'll separate the four CubeSats. Once we're done with that, we will actually do a fourth engine burn, and we're going to do something that we've never done before with the Delta off the West Coast. Uh, we're going to do a fourth engine burn to use up the remaining propellants and actually do a controlled re-entry of that second stage. So about two hours and ten minutes after launch, uh, another hour and ten minutes after we uh, separate the, the primary spacecraft, the upper stage will splash down in the South Pacific uh, several hundred miles east of New Zealand. And that will be the end of our mission. Well, Vern, thanks very much. So it's good to know that uh, we don't really have anything significant that uh, we're concerned about. Other than upper level winds, there's not much we can do about that. No, so, we'll, uh, we'll keep monitoring that. Yeah, we'll just uh, see what the uh, the uh, upper level wind balloons, what data they uh, they 
give us back. So, Vern, thank you very much. Okay, thanks, George. Yeah, working well, as an avionics mechanic. In 1987, Paul joined McDonnell Douglas as a member of the Delta II team in Huntington Beach. After 10 years in Huntington Beach, Paul joined the Boeing Delta II team here at Vandenberg Air Force Base. Paul led the team at the Space Launch Complex II Metrology Lab and performed various control room technical duties in support of the Delta II program. Upon the formation of United Launch Alliance, Paul continued his metrology and coordination responsibilities in support of the Delta II program. Paul also supported several Atlas V and Delta IV programs at Vandenberg and at Cape Canaveral. Paul is remembered by his teammates as being very caring and generous. He led many cam camping expeditions where he shared his love of the outdoors as well as a particular passion for fishing. Paul is greatly missed and his memory will live on in the hearts of his teammates. At T-minus 15 minutes and holding, this is Delta Launch Control. Debris assessment. This is a senior MEFCO, all hazard assessments, debris and toxics are green. Elo and senior MIFCO indicate clear up speed. All stations report questions or knowledge. Elo. Elo. MIFCO. Senior MIFCO. Delta RC. Elo, CRC. Could, could you give me a, a feeling for proton flux? Uh, stand by just a sec. Pull up the latest right Yeah, we are still good and uh, just around background level. Roger. No further. LD. LD. NLM? NLM. OD. This is the OD. I have a question with regards to uh, launch agency uh, weather constraints. Uh, are we red or are we green? Sir, we are currently green for the launch agency uh, constraints that we that we uh, hear uh, as they all uh, interrogate. And then LD, it is a user constraint that we're talking about in terms of the upper level winds, correct? That's correct statement, OD. This is not a uh, launch commit criteria for the launch agency. It's a user requirement uh, relative to upper level. Okay, copy that. I understand. No questions from the OD. LDA. LDA. Weather conference night clear. Bravo, Foxtrot, Alpha, Delta. Negative. You did it again. Bravo, Alpha, Foxtrot, Delta. Affirmative. limits prior to the end of the built-in hold. Roger. Established vehicle fuel tank vent closed. Closed. Vehicle fuel tank press open. Pressurized tank to 24 to 30 PSIG. Then vehicle fuel tank press closed. Pressurized. Launch enable on. On. Prop one, launch enable on. On. SSP, launch enable on. On. ATC-3, report the amp hours remaining for the following. CRD-1, 1.36. 1 one decimal 36 CRD-2, 1.37. 2 TM-1, org latch set. Set. TM-2, org latch set. Set. Timer, at T minus four minutes, verify the countdown clock is holding. Roger. Lock stopping is complete. Standing by now to go into the hold at T minus four minutes. Our topping off of liquid oxygen is now complete. And we're going on to the final built in hold in three, two, one, T minus four minutes and holding. This is a 10 minute plan built in hold. SMA. SMA is go. SMD. SMD is go. NASA MIM. NASA MIM go. 8 a.m. 10 a.m. is ready. ALM copies. The NASA team is ready for SMAP launch. LC timer. Right timer. Sequencer has been reprogrammed for a T0 of 14 colon 22 colon 00. Roger. SMA. SMA is good. SMD. SMD is go. NASA MIM. NASA MIM go. 8 a.m. 10 a.m. is ready. ALM copies. The NASA team 
is ready for SMAP launching. Sequencer has been reprogrammed for a T0 of 14 colon 22 colon 00. Roger. 